thinking about thinking. That's what metacognition is. We're going to crash through this. This requires a lot more than one lecture, unfortunately. So we're just going to crash through it quickly. So we make decisions quickly because that's one of the hallmarks of a good emergency physician. We don't have time to collect all the data. Okay, We don't have time to get every single bit of history. We don't have time to collect all the facts. There's just not enough time at all. So we have to make decisions fast with limited knowledge. That's one of the hallmarks of how you get by in this job. So let's start with the case. You've got a 54-year-old guy, comes in with chest pain. It's about an hour. It's going to his arm. You know, there's a little bit of diaphoresis, some nausea, no vomiting. It sounds like a very typical C-room patient that comes in with chest pain. You, you walk in, you see him, you're like, okay, what am I going to do with this? So is this a heart attack? The answer is you don't know. And the reason you don't know is you don't have enough information yet, but you're going to start acting on what lim limited knowledge you have. So if you act now, you might just be right. Thanks, creepy ShamWow guy. Uh, so there's something called thin slicing. Thin slicing is when you're using what little knowledge you have up front in a pattern recognition way to figure out what you're going to do. This is something that some specialties that will remain unnamed are completely incapable of doing, it seems, because they want all the knowledge. They want every last bit. And what we're used to doing is walking in that room, and we know 10 facts about this chest painter, and that's enough for us to at least start the process about whether we're getting EKGs, troponins, chest x-rays, all that, or whether we're not. And that's all because we thin sliced, okay? So we basically take what little we know and we use pattern recognition. Does this guy look like the prior STEMIs that you've had? Or does he look like the prior patients that, that didn't have anything? They just had bronchitis or whatever and they came in. Which one of those does it seem more like to you? What's your gut feeling? When you start at this, you're going to suck at it. You're going to be terrible, okay? And you're going to get humbled repeatedly when you're a med student or an intern and you walk in the room and you see this guy with chest pain and you have zero clue whether this guy has a heart attack or not. When you've seen enough folks, eventually you're going to start noticing patterns of like, oh, this guy looks a little gray. Oh, he's, he's diaphoretic. Oh, th this guy is actually kind of looking pretty ill. And you're not even going to be able to define what it is. You're just going to feel it. That's thin slicing. And in fact, if you push someone when they see like a patient for five seconds and they're obviously worried because I'm sure that y'all walked in the room and you're like, oh, this guy's kind of sick. And then you see, you know, an experienced clinician rush past you and be like, oh, get the ultrasound probe or whatever. Like this guy looks sick. They're like, how did he know? And that's because of thin slicing. So this was highlighted in a book called Blink uh, by Malcolm Gladwell. It's actually a really enjoyable read. It highlights how to make decisions quickly. And it's not very scientifically rigorous at all, but there's a lot of fun stories about it, including uh, ER and chest pain. Um, but it basically introduced the, the pop culture idea of people are able to do this, and it's actually pretty good. So we're not perfect. We're no EKG machine. But if you gave me a chest pain patient and said, is this guy totally sick or totally unsick? It, my guess is going to be right more often than it's wrong. Okay, That's not perfect. We're certainly going to do tests to further clarify that. But that initial hunch is really important. So then there's thick slicing. Okay, We just talked about thin slicing where we're looking at our, our initial gut feeling. Thick slicing is when you actually do that thing where you collect all the data, okay? You look through their chart. You find out more tests. You take a detailed history. You find out what their risk factors are. All these other things that kind of all come together to where you have more or less a, a, a mostly complete picture of what's going on. This is the opposite of thin slicing. This often manifests itself in our world with checklists, and I have a love-hate relationship with these. So like ACLS, ATLS, so forth. We were recently talking on a, a morning report about how do you run a trauma when trauma is not there. After a while, you'll be able to run a trauma in your sleep. It's not that hard. It's really simple. You, you follow the algorithm. Oh, airway. Okay, great. Breathing. It's not hard. All right. <laughs> it's super simple. All right. It really is. However, that first day when you're out in private practice and there's no trauma patient and a guy comes in with a bullet to the chest, I'm telling you, you're going to pause because you're like, oh, wait, where's, you know, X surgeon that I almost named, but I'm being recorded barking orders that aren't getting anything done. They're not there. You're like, why, why is this happening? Uh, no one ordered a lipase? What, what's happening? Like, you know, like that, that's not going to help you. You need to be ready. Okay. So as much as I make fun of ATLS and ACLS being the death of all clinical reasoning, they're actually helpful because you have something to fall back on. And that, that really helps out a lot. So the book that I would highlight for this is The Checklist Manifesto by Atul Gawande. He's a surgeon, and they decreased mortality at their hospital dramatically with a preoperative checklist that goes through things. And none of it was really sexy. It was like, hey, is this guy an intubation risk? Did he get his antibiotics in the appropriate time before his surgery? 
Do we have an appropriate backup plan? Like all these things that are really core, basic anesthesia stuff. And everyone looked at the checklist and said, there's no way this will save lives because it's all so basic. And it turns out that it did. And that's because people screw up. So it's basically talking about using of checklists in lots of things. It's how we build skyscrapers. It's how we should run our ICUs. These are important things to make sure that nothing is getting missed. I have a deep, deep respect for ICU doctors because they can walk in the room every day of someone that's been there for three weeks and ask, is this person having a PE? Every day. And I can't do it. I just can't because I'm so used to walking into a room once or twice when I'm seeing the patient downstairs in the ER and asking, am I going to work up PE or not? And I'm done. But I can't come back on Tuesday and say, hey, today, I know yesterday I said no, not a PE. What about today? Is it a PE today? I can't do it. I'm not very good at that. And I have a deep respect for those that can. But the way that they do that is they systematize. They look at the organ systems. They say, today, is this guy got anything going on in his lungs I need to address? Today, do I need to get an EKG or do anything on his cardiovascular system? Today, is there a problem with his electrolytes or GI system? Every day. And it is terribly tedious. And I hate it. And I'm so glad I don't have to do the job. So how do you combine those two things? So both those groups were pop culture books. This is, this is a beast of a book. And it's one of the best books I've read in the last decade. It is absolutely fantastic. If you want to get humbled and crushed by a book, this is the book to choose. <laughs> it's a 2011 book called Thinking Fast and Slow by Kahneman. It basically talks about how to marry these two systems because those two systems do different things. So you've got what they call um, system one, which is that gut instinct, okay? That's how a special forces operator can walk into a room not really fully process in their mind everything that's happening and make the right decision 99% of the time. And it's because they've done that over and over again and they're ready for it. They don't even know how they do it. If you talk to these folks like, how did that pilot do that thing? They may not even fully recognize what they did. They just did it. Firefighters that knew that the floor was about to collapse. And they don't know why. It was just something not right and they relied on their gut instinct and did it. That's system one. It's fast, but often wrong. But it's really impressively good considering how brief of a time you've got. So if you walk in the room and that guy looks terrible with his chest pain, that's system one telling you, look, this guy looks sick, be aware. And that's a good thing. System two is more slow and deliberate and logical. If you're actually using logic, thinking like, okay, if I order a dimer and it's over this number, I'm gonna do X. And if it's under that number, I'm gonna do Y. You're actually using system two because you're thinking about it. You're processing it. You've had more time to ponder it. You're scratching your chin about whether this GI bleeder goes to the floor versus the ICU. That's all system two stuff. Unfortunately, all of our lectures are talking about system two. We cannot teach you in this lecture hall how to use system one until you just go see a bunch of folks. We can drill it into you over and over again. That trauma patient, the first thing you do is airway, 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 every time. And we can do that, and eventually that's going to become part of system one. But you got to go do it. So when to thin slice? It's basically when you don't have enough time. Anyone that wants to hand a firefighter a checklist and say, okay, you walked into a room. Okay, uh, step one, is the floor on fire? Nope. Okay, <laughs> step two, like, it's not going to work. And unfortunately, sometimes the room is on fire. When you walk into a room and someone's about to arrest, you don't have time for checklists. I'm sorry, you don't. So this is why there's some things that you just have to be ready for, period. If you're delivering a baby and the baby comes out blue, it's not time to fumble out your palace card and be like, baby is blue. Uh, category one, make baby not blue. Like you can't, you don't have time for that. Okay. You got to go. All right. So that's when you have to thin slices when you don't have enough time. When to use checklists, which is when you're thick slicing, it's when you do have time. Now people, especially in the airway world, go back and forth about this. Should you have a checklist before every intubation you do? Some say, look, I intubate lots of folks. I don't need it. Okay. And I think the smarter folks say, no, you should follow a systematic thing every time. And the reason is the times when you most can't afford to screw up are the times that you want a checklist. So that trauma patient with a pulse ox of 70 is actually a decent time to consider using a checklist because everyone's ramped up. You need to be thinking, first, we need to pre-oxygenate. Okay, let's get the bag on there. That may have just flew right by you. How many times have y'all gotten ready to intubate in the ICU and realized that no one was actually pre-oxygenating the patient? That stuff happens because you got ramped up, system one took over, System two didn't say, wait a minute, we always pre-oxygenate. Who, who puts on the nasal cannula? Let's do it. You know, that kind of thing. That's important. Okay. So just because it's systematic doesn't mean it has to be slow. The folks that change, um, like the pit crews on racetracks, use a system. They come in and a guy's got a job. 
okay? And if you look at a smoothly ran trauma, you're like, you, you're doing the central line and I want it here. And it's very clear, there's no messiness. That's like guy in the front that's jacking up the, the, the car so that the guy right next to him can put the tire on there. Just because it's systematic doesn't mean it has to be slow. You can use a checklist for your intubations and be done with it in 30 seconds. I'm not a fan of checklists that take you know 20 minutes to complete. We're not airline pilots, we don't have that kind of time. So you can make it systematic, yet not take forever to do it. So unfortunately, that means you have to build your own systems that work for you, okay? You have to make personal checklists that work for you. When you see a chest pain patient, you're gonna recognize that there's some things that you screw up. Like maybe you, I, I used to forget to consider PEs on my chest pain patients. And now every time I see a chest pain patient, before I leave the room, I think, could this be a PE? And if not, why? Why is it that I'm not thinking it's a PE? And it may just be like, oh, it, nothing in this story matches it at all. I'm ruling out just, you know, clinically, and that's okay. But ask yourself, why is it that I'm exclusively thinking of ACS and putting on a chest pain pathway and not thinking PE? That's how anchoring happens. Is system one looks at it like, oh, that guy looks a lot like he's having a heart attack. And then you forget that actually his chest pain was pleuritic. And when I did that echo, maybe it was really the right ventricle that wasn't moving so hot. Huh, what's going on here? And if you attach, if you let system one take over and you don't stop and think, hey, is this a PE? Is this aortic dissection? Did I closely look at that chest X-ray? If you don't do those things, you're gonna be a murderer. I have to say that you could be a murderer in every one of my lectures today. So th there you go. So let's revisit that case. So you walk in the room, all right? You thin sliced him and said, you know what? This is actually a pretty decent story. You got a little diaphoresis, you know, he's old enough to where ACS makes a lot of sense. What, you know, what's going on? And you begin your initial evaluation to this guy, okay? You give him the aspirin, you do the, the, the blood work, you order the stuff, and that's great. That's system one. Later, you need to let system two take over where you stop and think, wait a minute, could this be a PE? What's going on? So you get more information, you get a more complete history. You do a bedside echo, you get serial EKGs, you check the troponins, and you appropriately disposition him. And then decide, you know what, he's high risk enough to where I want to admit him to cardiology. And the only way that you get from system one to system two is you have to swap over. You have to think about that. And thinking about thinking, the, the whole metacognition thing, is how you get better at this. So I really nerd out on this, and there's a lot of other stuff that we could talk about, but we don't have a ton of time for that. But by using things that work for you personally, it will help you get faster. When you go into the private world, it is totally okay when you are slammed and they just brought eight sick people back and you're the only doctor there to very quickly walk in, thin slice a whole bunch of folks, say, oh, okay, he's got belly pain. I literally did nothing more than say, hello, my name's Dr. McCollum. A lot of people just came back. I pushed on your belly, found out that you're a 75 year old with significant epigastric pain, decided that I was gonna order belly labs and walk out of the room. And that is okay because it is just you. And you're gonna go see the next person because they've got chest pain and you don't have time to take a full history. You better come back and talk to that person because you're gonna miss stuff. You're gonna miss that triple A that it didn't cross your mind because you thought they had pancreatitis or some such. You're gonna miss it, but you need to get that first thing going. When I was single coverage over at Trinity, I'd often, they, they would bolus you with a bunch of folks. And you'd look around and you're like, oh, that's right, it's just me. And you'd have to go see them really quickly. So you could quickly order a bunch of stuff get the, the, the ball rolling at least so that you're not the rate limiting step and then come back and let system two actually take a decent history. Wheel the ultrasound machine in the room, do an echo of that heart. Think about it so that you're not, again, murdering people. So what now? Recognize when you're using these two different systems, okay? Because they each have their merits and they each have their downfalls, but they complement really nicely. Use checklists that you personally develop for you. One of the best things you can do is make macros in the, the electronic medical records that is actually a checklist for you and read your macro. If your macro for back pain says they don't have X, Y, and Z, you better be certain that they don't actually have X, Y, and Z, and use that as a checklist to help your clinical process. But trust your instincts, especially as you get better at this, especially the third years. You guys have probably noticed, you walk into a C room and you're like, that guy's really sick, and you don't know why yet, okay? I'm still learning this. I don't have the clinical experience of a lot of the attendings. I just don't, I haven't seen enough patients yet, but it's getting better. And you got to listen to that little voice of, hey, you know what, there's something I'm missing here. And you got to be honest with yourself when you have no clue at all. You just got to be honest. Any questions? Thank you all very much.